In 2014, there were 4,344 killed. In 2013, there were 2,123 killed. And in 2015, there were 7,000 people killed by one of the most religious groups on our globe at this current time. They were killed by the group that we know as ISIS. And the only crime was that they professed to be Christian. They were beheaded. They were killed by uh, oil, being boiled in oil. They were all kinds of different uh, manner in which they were killed. Now they were killed because they were Christians. The first century Christians, the century in which Paul was saved, the first century Christian church suffered immensely for their faith. They suffered because they were Christians. And down through the centuries, they have suffered. Multitudes have suffered and given their lives because of their Christian faith. And back then, when you said you was a Christian, it meant something. It meant something as far as the world was concerned. Now, my Christian life has extended over some 56 years. And the changes in that short period of time is unbelievable. That short period of time has brought about so many changes in the Christian world. Some good, many bad. Today, so little is re required and expected from people who get saved. So little is expected of it. So little is required of it that it's hard, pardon this, the expression to tell, which is which, who is who. In other words, the church today, our Christians today, very little is expected of it. Very little is required. Now, I'm not here this morning to talk about nor to make salvation hard because the Lord made it so simple and so easy. But while it is simple and easy to get saved, there are certain things that come about as a result of being saved. Uh, for instance, that we experience in every facet of our human life. If you happen to be a member, let's just say you're playing for a sports team, then you wear that uniform, you practice at the times that they say practice, you uh, perform according to the coach, you do what they say do, you belong to them. You are their product. And your services are there. So today, let's make some applications. And using Paul as an illustration, we look at salvation when salvation meant something. When salvation meant something, what did it, what did it re re really mean? And what am I talking about? Well, salvation meant that you got corralled, you got arrested, uh, you got, you, so, somebody was after you. Uh, and, and this is what we need to realize today. We do not get saved when we want to get saved. We get saved when the Spirit of God is calling us. And I really believe this, that in my lifetime, I've seen so many people who got supposedly we got saved, but I believe that somebody else was calling them instead of the Spirit of God. 
Because when the Spirit of God calls you, something happened. You say, how do, it, how do you know that? Well, if Paul is the example, and I think he's the best example, uh, Paul didn't get saved when he wanted to get saved. He got saved when God was dealing with him. The Bible says that Paul, salvation was the farthest thing for Paul's mind. He wasn't, he wasn't even thinking about getting saved. He didn't even want to get saved. He wasn't even looking to get saved. Of all, of all the things, he was really opposing those who weren't saved. In fact, they so infuriated him, he was spending his entire life arresting them and having them prosecuted and persecuted and put to death. Case in point, Stephen. So Paul was not even looking for the Lord. We hear people today, well, I was looking for the Lord. No, we don't look for the Lord. He's looking for us. Amen? He's not lost. We are. And we are lost, and He has come looking for us. Look at what the Bible says concerning Paul. In verse 3 of chapter 9, he said, And suddenly, as he journeyed uh, there, uh, there, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. In other words, he saw something and he heard something. And I really believe this. I believe the night I got saved, I saw something and heard something. I heard, number one, that I was going to die of my sins and I was going to hell. I heard that. I, I heard that if I continued down the same road I was going, I was going to wind up in hell fire and brimstone and burn and be punished forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and in the agony of forever if you want to add on. You say, well, did that scare you? It sure did. It sure did. Let me say this, and I don't mean this uh, in any way disrespectful. He scared the hell out of me. Amen. <laughs> you say, well, preach that's not a good term. It did. Because I'll tell you what, that night I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. I heard something. And I saw something. What did I see? What did I see? A great light? Did, I, did heaven open up? Did I have a vision? No. Not like that. But I was painted a picture in by the preacher. And the preacher said that my hands held the hammer that drove those nails in his hand. My hands held the sword that I pushed made a hole in the side of the spear. My hands were the ones that pushed the crown of thorns down on his head. I could see me doing that. I could see myself because you know what? I realized how great a sinner I was. How terrible I was. I had nothing good to brag about. And the message that I heard corralled me. It I realized somebody was on my case. Somebody was on my trail and they were tracking me. And I realized it was Jesus Christ. So, salvation meant something. When salvation meant something, it meant I got to right. But too many people today are just invited in. Amen? They've just been invited in. No Holy Spirit conviction. But Randy, I believe people have to be convicted of their sin. You and I are sinners. Let me say that again. We are sinners and we deserve to die and go to hell. You say, well, I'm not as bad as some people I know. Yeah, but you're not as good as God, are you? 
Now, if you say you think you're as good as God, then if you think you're as good as God, you can go to heaven. You say, well, preacher, are you as good as God? Yeah. What? You see, I've been made as good as God through the imputed righteousness that Jesus has given me. He took all my sins and my sorrowness and my, my, my unworthiness. He took all of that and in turn He gave to me His righteousness. So when God looks at me, He sees no impurity. When God looks at me, He sees none of that. Why? He sees only the goodness of Jesus Christ. But you see, that comes as a result of being convicted of your sin. I realized that night that I was a sinner. Before that, by the way, I made this argument and pretty, pretty effective. I worked with people every day that went to church every Sunday. They cussed just like I did. They drank just like I did. They lived the same kind of life I lived. And the first person who asked me if I wanted to be saved, I said, and I'm well, yeah, but not right now. I said, I'm as good as so and so, and I called some of them saying. I think it was a shock to him because some of them went to his church. <laughs> but you see, they lied and stole and did all the kinds of things that I did, and I didn't see any difference. I just went to church on Sunday, and I went back to the beer hall. Or, or to that bootlegger's joint, got me another drink to get over the mess that I did on Saturday night. He said, well, preach you glorifying sin. No, I'm not. I'm telling you how bad a sinner I was. I'm glorifying grace this morning, brother. Yeah. I'm glorifying the Lord. But I want to say something to you. You're not going to go to heaven until you've been corralled. Yeah. You're not looking for the Lord. God's looking for you. God is tracking you down. And He's, by the way, you're going to meet up with Him one day. You may be, you may turn a corner. Boom. And he'll be. You ain't to deal with it. He's not too hard to deal with, but you have to deal with Him on Him turn. Not only that, you've got to be certified. What does it mean by being certified? It's not enough for people to think you are Christians. You got to be certified. Amen. I got. I worked with some. Uh, went the other day to do some work with some folks, and the folks said this guy was a smart aleck engineer. <laughs> he said, "Are you certified to do this job?" The guy said. I can do it. I don't want that certification or not. He said, no, do you have a piece of paper? Of course, you've got to have a piece of paper there today, right? Don't mean that it just means somebody got some money from you. Don't mean the same. Don't mean you can't do the work or anything like that. Then the way he said it, he said, by the way, this morning, are you a certified, bonafide, blood bought, blood washed, heaven recorded, believer? Somebody who knows Jesus Christ for certain. Do you know that for certain? Are you certified this morning? I'm a, I'm a certified believer. I'm certified born again. I don't have much education, but I got a BA. I've been born again. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Certification. Certified. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 41. It talks about these people that on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached and they trusted the Lord. Verse 41 it says, And they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 so. Now, did you know this? I don't know what, whether you've been baptized or not, but baptism certifies your salvation. It signifies your salvation. It doesn't seal your salvation. It has nothing to do with your salvation, but it certifies that you have been saved. 
So the Bible tells us that when you get saved, once you get corralled, amen, and get convicted and you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the next step is to certify that. What did the early Christians do? They certified their belief. They certified, yeah, I'm a believer. And they got baptized. Now, baptism no washes away sin. Baptism no adds nothing to this cleansing of sin. But it tells everybody that watching you get baptized, I am a certified believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember the night I got saved. You remember the night you got saved? How many of you remember when you got saved? It may have not been a night. It may have been a day. But you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when you got that time? I remember when I got baptized. That was a big deal for me. I had several of my friends sitting out there. And they told me, they said, I'm going to come see this. I don't believe this is going to happen. I don't believe you go through this. I said, man, I don't have no problem going through with this. And I remember the night I got baptized. It didn't make me no more saved than I was about three weeks before when I got saved. But I tell you what, I sure was glad I followed the warm baptism. Because I wanted everybody to say out there to know that was watching me that I had been saved by the grace of God. That I was born again. So, you got when salvation meant something to me. I just wasn't making a little religious profession and telling everybody, yeah, I'm a Christian. But when it came really down to it, I got certified. Then, <laughs> when salvation meant something, you got cleaned up. Not only did you get corralled, you got certified, you got cleaned up. You won't believe this, but I used to cuss like a sailor. Every breath I drew almost was a curse word as it came out. Vilest mouth you've ever heard in your life. My brother testified to that. Vilest mouth. I didn't care who it was, children, women, it didn't make no difference. Vilest language you've ever heard in your life. And I'm not bragging on that this morning. I'm bragging on the Lord Jesus because He cleaned me up. Amen. Amen. I remember some of my friends grabbed me one day. Well, they didn't grab me. I got the car with them. They just come by and said, you want to go to the race? We're going to run off to the race. We got in the car. There was three of them and one of me. And I got in the back seat. And we had gotten about halfway between uh, between Bassett Forks and uh, Oak Cliff. And they pulled out a fifth of liquor. Okay, now I ain't been saved about four or five weeks. Now I'm reading the Bible every day. Never read the Bible before in my life. I'm reading the Bible every day. And I'm trying to live for God. And they throw a big quart of whiskey back in the back seat and says, here, have a drink. What am I going to do? What, what I need to do? What am I going to do? Now, I know that they didn't believe I was saved. Now, wait a minute. Let me rephrase that. They had to believe something that happened to me. Because if... This would have happened before I said I got saved. There ain't no way they'd have handed me a fifth of liquor. Because they wouldn't have got it back. <laughs> but they were putting me to the test. I remember to this day what it says. I handed it back up to them and I said, I don't need this, fellas. I'm drinking from a different well. Amen. I said, you're crazy. I said, yeah, I guess I am. <coughs> they cleaned me up. I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day and worked eight hours in the furniture factory where you couldn't work or couldn't smoke. One cigarette right after the other. 
God showed me that before. I was witnessing to a fellow one day at where I work. And he said, I said to him, you need to get saved. He said, are you saved? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, it looks like you are with that big cigarette hanging out your back. And I said this to the Lord too. I said, Lord, if a cigarette that I've spoken is going to cause a person to die and go to hell, I've never spoken that one as well. Amen. 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 Used to go to all of the dances. I, I couldn't dance a lick. I had no rhythm. <laughs> I had no rhythm. But I'd go. I decided that's what, where I needed to be. Where is the old-fashioned Bible-believing folks who just get cleaned up? I mean, salvation cleans them up. It makes a difference in their life. I've heard Randy's testimony. Well, I mean, you think of the testimony that you've got. Is your testimony what it ought to be? God cleans you up. You can't lay down with the dogs and not get up with that without having fleas all over you. You can't run. Evil communications corrupt good manners, the book says. You get cleaned up. Amen? I mean, you get cleaned up. You say, well, you think you're better than everybody. No, I know Jesus is better than everybody else. I know that if he removes his hat from me this very day, after 50 plus years, I'd be right back in the mud hole and a cesspool that I was in before I got saved. Amen. If it wasn't for his grace, Amen. I'd be right back in there. I understand that salvation means you get cleaned up. And then number four, you got, you get to sit down. You get to sit down to represent him. Before I got saved, I was a representative, representative of my father. Not my earthly father, but my spiritual father, who was the devil. I represented him. I did everything he wanted me to do. And a lot I don't think he really wanted me to do. <laughs> He may have wanted me to do it, but not as bad as I did. He sent me in. These last 50 years plus, God sent me out to preach the gospel. Have you ever considered this, that maybe God wants to use your life? God has a right to. He owns you. You know, they said, I read an article the other day, and they said, if the Lord tarries 20 years, that, that a great percentage of the churches will close for the lack of preachers. Why? Because most young people, I'm going to be a doctor, a lawyer, I want some money. I want them jobs to get some money. Nothing wrong with that. That's what God wants you to do. But I tell you what, you ought to make God turn you down. <laughs> you ought to tell God, okay, I'm going to preach the gospel. And then God said, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to, I want you to be a truck driver. And God has truck drivers, amen? He has lawyers and everything. He ain't half Christian judges, ain't he? <laughs> but you see, we ought to give God first shot at it, amen? God has first choice. He made you. Now, <clears throat> let me quickly finish this up by saying this. There are, there are three things that God wants from every person in this building this morning. First of all, God wants your acknowledgement. As you look at this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 9, here's Paul, one of the most educated persons of his day, one of the most powerful and influential persons in his religion, 
a man who had great credibility, and he didn't even acknowledge God. The first thing that God wants from you and me is to acknowledge Him. He wants us to acknowledge who He is. Who He is. See, many people today don't even acknowledge He exists. For the most part, most of the people in the educated world, they don't even acknowledge that God exists. And many people live their lives today as if God does not exist. They, they, I mean, they go through life never recognizing God whatsoever. But God wants you to acknowledge that He is there, that He exists, that He has a life. How do I do that? First of all, through confession. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess my need of salvation. I confess Jesus Christ is my Savior, that He is the Son of God. I acknowledge the God of heaven, the God of the universe, and when I acknowledge Him, I will confess my sin, I will confess Him in salvation, and I will confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I will, if there will be an admission in my life, It'll be, this admission is this. I'm nothing, he's everybody. I'm weak, he's strong. I'm wrong, he's right. I'm left, he's right. I'm no good, he's everything. Everything I am, I am by the grace of God. I acknowledge that. I admit that. You see, it doesn't hurt you to agree with God. What hurts is when you disagree. Because you see, God is never wrong about you, about Him, or about anything. God is always right. So when you agree with Him and admit Him, then He has a perfect right to work in, the, in our life. Then there's a commission that God gives us, and that commission is this. All that I am all that I ever hope to be, I will be by Him. Amen. Let me say this. If you live to be a hundred years old and you amass a billion dollars, if you do not have anything other than what you've amassed as far as money is concerned, you don't have anything laid up in heaven. You're a loser, big time. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, don't lay up your treasures on this earth. And you'd be surprised what people count as treasures. Amen? Somebody said that when you go to a yard sale, one man's junk is another man's treasure. Amen. Now let me say this to you. When Jesus Christ comes into your life and changes your life, you have to realize that if I'm ever going to accomplish anything and ever amount to anything, it has to be because of Him. Amen. The second thing God wants from you and me is not only acknowledge, but He not only wants us to acknowledge Him, but He wants our allegiance. We're having a big problem with that in America today, I don't know how you feel when you see these athletes who are making multi-millions of dollars a year and the flag, you know, we're singing or, or making these plans to the flag and, and they are sitting down and they are doing all this other kind of stuff. How does that, does that bother you? It bothers me. It bothers me that I would put my life on the line and go face an enemy and fight to give them the right to be born in a country like this and then them not pledge allegiance to that flag. Amen. You can, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with their right to disagree. But there are ways to do it without disrespecting Amen. our flag. 
and the lives of those who have been, and, and not only the people who went, but the people who stayed at home and worked and did what they did. It is a deal. How do you think God feels? When He looks at us, and He made, made us, you're in this world because He made you. You're here because He decreed that you are here. And then you give your allegiance to somebody else. Could I just point out some things? We give our allegiance to political parties. Some people are more faithful and committed to a political party than they are the Lord. We give our, our allegiance to political parties, clubs and organizations, jobs, schools, sports, community and social projects, family, friends, but nothing for God. Nothing for God. No time for God. That's why our church is not full today. You think we have enough members on the road to fill this building up? Did you know that? Twice, by the way. Well, what's the problem? People's allegiance is to something else rather than God. You see what I'm talking about? And their allegiance is to something that won't amount, amount to anything. But to God, it makes a difference within everything. So God wants our acknowledgement. We, he wants us to know that He's there. Number two, He wants our allegiance. And number three, He wants our availability. How available are you? The greatest ability you possess, and I possess, it's not nobility. It's not ability. Yeah, you guessed it. It's availability. How available? <laughs> I mean, if you have a brain tumor or a brain aneurysm, and there is a brain surgeon uh, close by that could render help to you and assistance to you, if he's not available, what good is it to you? No good at all to you, right? If there's someone who has an ability to help you, if, you're, if, if they're just not available, what good is there as far as you're concerned? Now, the Bible wants to know, are you available? In Acts chapter 9 and verse number 6, Paul said this, as the Lord was talking to him. In, in verse 6, listen to what Paul said. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will that have me to do? He was available. Are you available for that? You say, well, I, I don't know what I could do. The first thing you can do if be available is make yourself available. I read a story uh, about a woman who had reached uh, old, uh, the older age, senior citizen age, and she had worked in uh, public work for a lot, and she had played piano in the church. For years and years. But she got to where she couldn't, she couldn't do that. She, this, her, her physical body wouldn't allow her to do it. So she asked the Lord, Lord, what can I do? What can I, I want to do something for you. She came across this idea. She ran an ad in the newspaper and said, uh, anyone who might be depressed or discouraged or you might be just down in the, in the dumps. If you'll dial this number and tell me the song, I'll play a hymn for you and you can listen to it over the phone. Well, in this modern day, in the interpretation of modern day 
all the effects that we have, that wouldn't go very far. But she did what she could do. In a few short time, a little short time, she wound up with hundreds of people calling her and asking her just to play a hymn. And they had listened to it over the phone. But it didn't stop there. She wound up talking to them, encouraging them. God opened that door. Are you available? Are you really available? <coughs> That's all God wants to know. Are you available? Paul wasn't available to God at the beginning. He wasn't available at all, but once he met the Lord, and once he realized that there was somebody in the world bigger than he was, once he was convinced that he couldn't fight against his power, then he realized. <laughs> you know, I see it this, somebody said, Oh, man, I, I'm ditching this losing team. I'm signing that just on the winning team over here. Amen? <laughs> Everybody knock me off the horse, get me on my knees, and save my soul, and give me something I can be proud of and be glad of and feel and know about. I am the man. Amen. You know, we have something like that every year in baseball, football, basketball, all of the major sports. It's called the draft. All these athletes in that particular sport put their name in the pot and say to all of these teams, I am available. Question we have to ask this morning of ourselves is this. Have you put your name in the pot? Have you put your name in the pot and said to the Lord, Lord, I'm available to whatever you want. I'm ready to do it. By the way, he's signing people left and right. First round draft choice, fifth round draft choice, 500 round draft choice. I don't know where I came in, probably. But <laughs> now, it was so far out as it was pathetic. But it doesn't make it a difference. He's taking everyone who will submit and submit. Lord, I'm alone. I don't know what I can do. If you had known me when I was 20 years old, 19 years old, just got out of the military, you would have said he is definitely not preacher material. <laughs> And probably there's a lot of people who have seen that, and maybe some of you <laughs> have felt that God may have been taking that. But I do know this, that God arrested me, He saved me, He sealed me, He certified me, and He sent me. And He has empowered me simply. And all I want him to know is, I'm a Amen. Praise God. And that's all he asks of you. Are you a And you can't put stipulations to it. You can't say, Lord, I'm available on this time, and this time, and over here. No, no. He don't, he don't, he don't play that game. And any of you would be willing to take a piece of paper and sign your name at the bottom of it and say, Lord, the only sentence on there is, Lord, this paper is blank. You fill in the blank. I'll do it. That's all God has. That's. that's all He wants. And I'm guaranteeing you, <laughs> you will never, ever be disappointed. It might not be all easy, 
I think of those 7,000 people that got killed by ISIS. By the way, they're not over there now. They're over here. They're over here. And you say, well, that doesn't affect me. Oh, it does. Oh, it does. And you know why they're here? They're not here necessarily to overthrow our government. They're looking for you and me. They're looking for anybody who says they're a Christian. Their fight is with Christians, not democracy. Because once they get rid of the Christians, they can put in anything they want. And you say, who knows where they'll show up? You may, you may miss them at this mall, but you may go to the theater and they'll be there. You may miss them at the theater, but then you may go to the grocery store and they'll be there. You may miss them at the grocery store and the theater and the mall, but you, they may come in your school. You don't know what they do. So what's it going to do? I like that young lady that was shot first at Columbine. The young man pointed the gun at her head and said, Are you a Christian? She hesitated. None. Yes. He blew her brain out. What a way to go to heaven. Amen. Amen. What a way to go to Did you know what this whole, how this thing, whole thing ended up and I'm through? was Paul. Some years later, after this incident we read about in Acts chapter 9, Paul found himself in Rome. He was in prison. He was in prison for preaching the Bible. And just a few months after he was put in prison, you can read about it in Timothy, 2 Timothy. He said, I have finished, my, finished the course. I fought it in fight. I've kept the faith. Just a few short weeks or hours after that, after he wrote that, they took him out, strapped him down, put his head over a block of wood, and they had a sharp axe and they cut his head off. What was his crime? It really means something to be saved, amen. amen. It really means something to be saved, Christian. This is not for cowards. It's not for actors or hypocrites. It's not for just those who want to play with. This is for people who really and God. I, I hope that you're encouraged by this message. I hope that you're challenged by it. Because who knows? One of us may have to pay the price. Father in heaven, thank you this morning for the Word of God that challenges us to be a Christian. Challenges us to be certified. Challenges us to take our stand for Jesus Christ. I pray for every person in this room today that you will make us strong. If there's a person here who does not know for sure that they are saved by the grace of God, may this be the time that they set it up. If there's a person here who has not followed the Lord and believe his baptism, I pray that this will be the time to say, I'm going to certify my faith and be baptized.
baptized. I'm going to follow the Lord in baptism. There's a person here who's not united with a Bible believing church. They just need the time that they would say, This, I'm going to take my stand with God's people. And may every one of us here this morning be willing to say, I'm available, whatever you want. I'm here. Would you stand with me, please? It's about nice people. Is there anyone here to say, Preacher, if I were to die, I'm not 100% sure that I'd go to heaven. I'm not 100% sure that I'm saved. Preacher, would you slip your hand up anyone anywhere? All right. Is there anyone, yes, is there anyone here this morning to say, Preacher, I, I've made a profession of faith, but I don't have the deep down assurance. Or I'm not, I'm not really committed to the Lord like I ought to be. I've never been baptized. I've never gone to church. Pray for me. Would you sit down? Yeah. yeah. Is there someone else? How many Christians would say, Preacher, I want the Lord this morning. It's not that I'm obeying. Would you slip your hand up? I'm obeying. God bless you. God bless you. Father, for those this morning who have questions about their salvation, I pray that, Lord, they'll get it settled. Because it's a terrible thing to think maybe y'all are dead, maybe not, and not know what it is not what you want. Because you lived heaven and came to earth and died for our sins, that we might know that we've been washed in blood, that our names are written in the land. I pray this morning, Lord, that you will help those who may have questions about that to get it settled today. Thank you for those who have lifted their hands and said, I want the Lord to know what I'm going to do. Help us, Lord, to live each day in a, with a mindset that we're ready to do what God wants us to do. Now, can I ask you to do this? you to keep your head out for just a moment. If you raise your hand and said, I'm not sure about your salvation, I don't know. would you like to settle that today? Wouldn't you like to leave here knowing for certain? And you know the only reason, the only way I know that I'm saved is because of what it says in the Bible. I couldn't give you that assurance, but I could show you in the Bible what the Bible says if you do so settle. As you know, that for sure you're saved. Would you like to do that? I'm going to ask you if you would. If you would like to know for certain that you'd say, would you this morning just step out from where you are and come down here to the front? And I'll take you back. And I'll show you how so you can know for certain that you're saved. Would you do that? I'll meet you here at the front if you would come. Anybody else? Okay. We'll 
waiting for you. God is waiting. Are you available? He wants to give you assurance if you trust Him. Just sit back and come on. You want to do it. God wants you to do it. Why don't you do that thing? If you will come, maybe someone else will. Would you do it? Sit back and come. Right now. Christian, would you come and just say a prayer for these folks that they might get assurance? like to come and get a Would you like to come now? These folks are praying for you. That you would have assurance. Don't put this off. You don't know whether you'll make it home or not. What a terrible thing to face eternity. And I know it for sure. I'm just not trying to get people to come forward. I'm trying to get people to have peace and assurance in your heart. Would you come? Would you do that right now? Sit back from where you are. Come on. Thank you for your powerful message.